Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Podcast powered by First National. I am Adam Powadik sitting here with Aaron Cameron at the Landed Development Conference here in downtown Toronto. This is part of our speaker video series uh, sponsored by Fuller Landau. We have a very interesting uh, guest today, Anna Bailau, Head of Affordable Housing and Public Affairs at Dream Asset Management. Uh, she's been a, an insider and then I guess well, an outsider would be the opposite of that. Maybe not, but she's she's even both sides of trying to tackle the affordable issue, both on the government side and on the uh, developer side. So it should be a very unique perspective on, uh, you know, what is probably the hottest topic in, uh, in our real estate today. Uh, Anna, welcome. Thank you. Great to be yeah. here. So let's first of all set the stage. Maybe jump back uh, back in your career. How'd you get to where you are today? Um, what you're doing at Dream, and then we'll get into, of course, uh, how we're all going to solve this in the next five years. Well, I I got into real estate and specifically affordable housing because of the work that I've done um, as a politician. Um, I was elected in 2010, and at a time that nobody cared about affordable housing. Nobody could get a headline in one of the newspapers. I actually had a lot of people coming to me and like, why are you spending so much political capital on affordable housing? You know nobody <laughs> votes on affordable housing, right? And so for me, it was always an important issue being, you know, um, uh, I, I always understood the impact that it had on building cities, on urbanism. And so for me, it was always something that I wanted to uh, uh, dive into. And so I started working on affordable housing. And at the time, the city of Toronto had a very small committee that uh, met four times a year. Uh, it was uh, the Affordable Housing Committee. And it was basically a committee just to give out the uh, investing in affordable housing money that we were getting from the federal government. And so uh, that's how it started. And um, the issue got bigger and bigger. I was able to uh, rearrange things inside City Hall, get the support of my colleagues. Uh, and today, you know, we have a planning and housing standing committee. Um, there was, you know, a change of investment from $96 million when we started to today, the capital budget is $4 billion. Um, so there was a lot that was done in in the city and, and it's uh, something that I'm deeply passionate about. But after 12 years and, you know, as deputy mayor, as chair of planning and housing for five years, I said, it is time to... Uh, to continue my work on affordable housing, but now in a different way. Uh, so very focused at Dream to bring these projects to fruition and, and continue to work with the government because to build affordable housing, it's all about partnerships. Um, and uh, so I'm sure we'll talk about more about that. What's the relationship between City Council and uh, Toronto Community Housing Corporation? So Toronto Community Housing, uh, the, the, the city is the sole shareholder of Toronto Community Housing, which is the largest landlord, you know, 58,000 units. It's social housing, so it has, you know, a budget of, I think now it's probably around 1.2 so billion. back in 2010, when you're having those four meetings a year, was that predominantly just how much money to give to no, TCHC? No, no, TCHC didn't even, it was so siloed inside City Hall. So you had, at that time, it was, it was interesting. So planning was about planning. It was about building. You know, when you talk to them about economics and how to build housing, it's like, that's not our responsibility. We're here to enforce the Planning Act. So they saw that very much as that role. That's how I felt. Then you had Toronto Community Housing respond, responding to a different department. And then you had this small committee that was basically about building new affordable housing through the money that we were getting from the federal Is government. Is that now Create TO? Or how does Create TO fit into this? I'm just trying to understand yeah. the landscape. So, so right. everything was kind of brought together inside the housing secretary. So today you have a housing secretary that creates policy. And there was a big shift as well that happened in the city of Toronto. The city stopped selling land for the highest and best use and started creating it, uh, to, to starting using it to create affordable housing. So you see projects like many of the Housing Now projects that the land value is used by the city to create affordable housing with the private sector. And so a CREATIO was created to deal with all the real estate and city building opportunities and housing is one of them. And so they're part of that, that equation as well. But the housing secretariat deals with TCHC, deals with policy, deals with programs like incentives to create the private sector to create more housing. So it, it is much more concentrating and it goes to the same committee as planning, which is really important because we know that planning and especially zoning and so on has a huge impact on the economics of, of housing and making housing work and creating more housing, right? It, it was it was basically started thinking about that housing continuum. You know, there's 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 a housing continuum. When you're creating housing policy, you, you need to create housing continuum. 
the market is never going to create housing, for example, like we have at Toronto Community Housing. You know, the, the average income of somebody living in, in Toronto Community Housing is $16,000 a year. The market is not going to create that housing. Without, need, in, without incentive. It, well, a lot of incentive. A lot of, yeah. <laughs> a lot of incentive. That is the return, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make that math work, it's going to be a lot of incentive. We had um, Selena Raji mm-hmm. on, uh, from Create TO. And, and she was I mean, awesome and an incredible, incredible person. And, and opposite of you, to a certain degree, came from the private sector and then kind of joined, joined Create TO, which I don't know if I've considered that public, but it, I guess it is, though they operate sort of like on a, on a for-profit basis to a, to a certain degree. She was talking about part of the challenge um, that, that exists, and I, I mean, I'm curious what your opinion is on this, is that when you're asking for what do we want to do with this piece of land, you get, okay, we wanted to have sort of environmental bend. We wanted to have an affordability bend. We wanted to be this. We wanted to be that. She's like, okay, great. If I take all of that in and then I run a pro forma, we actually have to pay the developer millions of dollars to buy this land. Because at some point, it just has to make sense for you know, the private sector to get involved. How do well, you balance? The math, the math needs the to math work. The math needs to work. And, and, and let's, let's focus on that because I think that's part of the, the biggest obstacle right now we have. When, when often we have, obviously, we spend most of our time talking to sort of the private institutions that are for profit that have a very, very strong interest in helping solve the housing crisis that we're in. And their frustration at times with, you know, when we're talking about, uh, call it the other side, you were an insider, never an outsider. I'm not sure we should be painting it as opposite. Different sider. Different yeah. sider. <laughs> that the, the different side doesn't necessarily appreciate that there just has to be like a dollar and cents yield at the end of the day, right? And I, I don't know how you balance that. And you've seen both sides. So what do you, what is that, how does that <laughs> materialize in your brain? Well, the, the first thing is that there needs to be a much better understanding of the economics of building housing inside the governments. And I see a bit of a difference in, inside the city of Toronto. Um, you're starting to see, um, as they are creating policy to go out and work on the economics and say, does this make sense? They contract out, look at performers to see how the policy is working or not working. I cannot remember that being done 10 years ago. And, and that is huge, right? I, I used to say, you know, you can create feel-good policy that makes you feel great. But headline, we always talk about headline, headline right? policy. Yeah, right? it's, yeah. it, you can get that done and nothing will, will you, you get no shovels in the ground, or you can get, uh, you know, uh, actually housing built. And the perfect, what, where I felt that the most was when the city was developing the inclusionary zoning policy and we, we brought in Ed and BLC and went through all the performers. And, you know, there was a lot of people, a lot of councillors at the time that said, well, we need 30%. And I'm like, okay, so you're going to get zero because zero mm-hmm. out of 30% is still zero. So this, they're telling us that you can only get 5%. You're actually... You know, that's that's what the math is showing. So, But it was hard for, for people that are not used to deal with performance, to deal with economics, to deal with the math, um, to bring that into the equation. I think it's happening a little bit more. It needs to happen a lot more. And especially now when you're seeing so much policy being brought forward, um, which is great. Uh, but the issue right now for troubles to get in the ground is all about math, right? When we're talking about the, you know, more of the market side, the what, what I often call workforce housing, which, you know, you could have the private sector playing a role and, and it's the only way, way that you can actually have scale on that. You need the incentives. You need the math to work. You need to make mm-hmm. sure that governments understand how can you stack all these incentives, federal, provincial, and, and, and municipally, to make sure that the math works. At the end of the day, that is what's going to get shovels in the ground. So for a while at the federal level, they're kind of hiding behind the the, uh, the concept of, well, it's not a federal issue. Uh, obviously, that's been a, a big departure from that position in you know more recent years. Is What was your view, you know, when 2010, when you're starting out and at the federal level, there was very little involvement. Was that the way the system is supposed to work? Or is this, is this more advantageous now that they are involved, even though theoretically they're not supposed to be because it's a provincial matter? So I think, you know, I... I, I there's, if there's something I do not agree is that government, the federal government should not be involved. There's so much that they do that have an impact on housing uh, that they always need to be involved and they have a huge role to play. Um, they played a role, you know, decades ago and we saw, you know, the amount of social housing, the amount of rental housing, the amount of, you know, housing right after the Second World War that was built. It was all led through the federal government. So they have a huge role to play. When I came in in 2010, 
they were very hands off. There was a program. It was the investment investing in affordable housing. And it was a good, you know, it was $150,000 a door. So for that time, it was quite significant. It was, you know, not to the scale that we needed, but it did create some affordable housing in, in, in the city as well. But that was about it. You know, Toronto community housing was crumbling. We had to create a huge campaign to uh, get the 1.3 billion that we got from the federal government uh, to renovate the the Toronto community housing but but they do have a huge role to play they came in with a national housing strategy um, I think they are now throwing everything at it um, I often say you know a lot of these actions have been called by people in the housing sector for many, many years, right? And some of the things, I mean, the HST, they had it on their platform years ago, finally got it done. They're, they're heading in, in the right direction. I think that right now, the issue is that you, you need to be working on two tracks. The situation is so bad right now. You have no housing starts, you don't, you affordable or rental or condo, like it, it's really hard. In most parts, I, I, you know, this is a very Toronto-centric uh, no, now, okay, uh, yeah. uh, no, no. <laughs> Vancouver-centric uh, view. It's okay, but they all hate us anyway. We're always talking about <laughs> Toronto. Um, but so uh, that you need to make sure that you actually create some very specific programs to have the math working right now with the market conditions that we're facing and the economic conditions that we're facing. And I think, you know, governments could actually take some opportunities to have a bit of a, a rental boom, for example, because... You know, we have tons of projects that are completely zoned, condo projects that are completely zoned. I often use this example. You know, in Toronto, when um, we didn't have office space being built, the city created a program. It was called the IMET program. No development charges, no property taxes for 10 years. Why aren't we doing that for rental right now? Yes, we're in a more pronounced what? rental housing crisis than we were office crisis, exactly. I'm sure. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so so I think there there's some policies that need to be tackled right now for this specific that could actually turn this challenge that we're going through with the market conditions into an opportunity. But I think there's some, obviously, all the conversations we're having about rezoning and, you know, the yellow belt. Those are great, but they're not going to get shovels in the ground in the next two or three years, right? Those are long-term conversations that need to happen, and, and it's great. So I think governments need to be working on a two-track approach. The longer term, the ones that is going to get the shovels in the ground in four years yeah, and five immigration years. Immigration policy changes exactly. and, and, well, and, and all and that And that even stuff. deep, deep conversations. For example, is it time for us to start thinking about this concept of growth paying for growth? Let's be honest about it. Is there been a generation that has benefit more from the real estate than our generations and previous generations? No. And we benefit from all the infrastructure get, that gets paid by the new renters and the new homeowners. And they can't even fathom to think about owning a home. So is it time to think this concept of growth, paying for growth, when 25, about 25% of the housing costs is you know, taxes and so on. So maybe it is time for us for governments to have a conversation. Now, the infrastructure still needs to be built. Yeah. So that's the, infra the, the conversation that needs to happen between governments because municipalities can't say, okay, we're just not going to charge all these things mm -hmm. and we'll pay. They don't have the, the, the other tools. So this conversations, these are longer conversations, but given where our housing situation is and given where we need to go and the, the level of production that needs to, to happen, all these need to, ha to, to take place. But at the same time, we have a huge crisis right now. Housing starts, starts have stalled, and we also need them to take very immediate and maybe time-stamped measures right now to spur that construction. I mean, we've had this conversation a lot on, the, on this podcast, and, 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 and boiling it down, you know, do this quickly so we can fast track. Um, you know, the hard costs aren't changing. You can't control the price of commodities, whatever that is. And, th and there we will probably rise with inflation and, and maybe some blips up and down. But for the most part, that's uncontrollable. Labor costs, I mean, we know that's going up. There's a whole, whole there's a whole a multiple podcast of episodes talking about just the impact of, of the brain drain and retirement and the lack of ability for um, um, mentorship and all that kind of stuff that's going on in labor. So you can't really control that either. Um, but there's actions that governments the, yeah, could no, take. Agree. Yeah, and yeah. then that, they will. It's more solvable than commodities. That is, yeah, more solvable. But again, it's long term. You, that's not yeah. just a, you know, a, a, a snap of the fingers. Um, interest rates, again, uncontrollable. I would suggest they're staying flat. Let's just assume they're flat. So again, that cost is fixed. There's nothing you can do. The, the only one that is 
actually controllable with the stroke of a pen is taxes, is the DCs ultimately. And I'm I know you say land because I think zoning does have an impact yeah, on no, land fair. prices. No, no, but mm -hmm. the, the reality is, no, that's true. But the land is a byproduct of the math, right? So, yep. so I mean, if it, whatever the math works out, that's the price of the land. So, so true, the land will will, will vary, but it it's not. You can't change a policy to impact the price of the land to the same degree you can change DCs uh, or all taxes at that level. Um, and we've always talked about that. If, if you, there's just a, 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 I've got a two part question. Let's save DCs for a second, okay? Let's go one way and then we'll go back. Part of the challenge that we have as a community, the commercial realistic community, now you're part of this community, not the, not the other side, is the, the narrative that the developer. You know, one, the big bad developer, there's that negative connotation. Two, the developers always making tons of money. They're super rich. And so they can afford, they can afford it is the kind of the narrative here. Now, whether that's media driven or that's actually the belief inside government, you tell me. Um, when you, you know, we talked about just the, the, the psyche inside the, those walls in, in government institutions, how they're slightly starting to change and their math, they're starting to understand that it is a kind of math. But yet there's still, I believe, that overall belief that it's, the developers can afford it. The developers are making a ton of money, which is not wrong. Like the, the reality is they are like, you know, the, the, the developers are making a lot of money, but not a big percentage return. That's the difference. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. And I guess this is where I'm going with this. It's, it's, it's the, it's the understanding. Like, and this is where I think there's the disconnect. If I had to, to offer my opinion, you're right. Developers do make a lot of money when they actually get the thing built and get it delivered. But they're also taking on an enormous amount of risk, right? If you're going to invest in a stock that could go to zero any day, you would expect to make a 20% return. You, but though you wouldn't do it. Most people would never do that. You want to invest in a, in a stock that will never decrease in value, and you're happy with a 3% return. Developers, they earn a large return because they could lose every dollar they have any minute. And we're looking at it like there's lots of developers right now that are, that are, that are going under. Is that lost on 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 the government that yeah they're making a lot of money because they're taking an incredible amount of risk and in, in investment communities whether you're investing in EFTs or mutual funds or you're a pension fund with a diverse portfolio you're always talking about your risk adjusted return right i think there's an adjustment happening right i think that uh, especially in cities like toronto and vancouver that had such a construction boom um, you know, I think staff and everybody is so used to just having people wanting to come in and wanting to develop and making money in condos. You know, the, the stories that, that people hear is, you know, half the condo is sold in a weekend. And, you know, that's not the reality right now. And I think people are starting to understand and starting to also create um, more policies, for example, for purpose-built rental. And the fact that the economics are so different, they're starting to understand that. And the fact that, you know, CreateTO came in, started to develop, you know, those performers are going you around. Sleep, you got Salima inside saying, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, you have even other projects that there are directly dealing with uh, the, the construction manager, right? Some of the modular has it. So they, see, they start seeing some of these things themselves because there has been, you know, production of, of housing. Uh, yeah. through the city. So I think that understanding is, is uh, changing a bit. It's still a challenge at all levels of government. Like I, I, so often I talk with people at CMHC and I keep telling them, you know, risk is affordability. If you do affordable housing, you need to take some risk. <laughs> you need to share some of the risk with us now. Us, you know, now, I'm, I'm now you're an insider on this <laughs> yeah, side. On yeah. this side. Uh, you need to take, you know, risk is, is the same as affordability. So um, there's, there's, there's still a long way to go, yeah. but because housing is such an important issue and it's such a fundamental issue. And I think that, you know, voters have clearly now made that an issue. Uh, governments are paying attention. They know that they need to take action. Uh, and so I think that is, is uh, uh, trickling it down. Do you, go ahead. Was it, which, uh, in the next federal election, what housing initiative would get the most votes then? If you're trying to appeal to the public, not to you know developers or uh, lenders like us, you know it's 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 a tough one because I think that um, this budget was an indication actually of uh, some frustration. People are feeling frustrated, and there was so much of housing policy, and there was money, there was policies, there was all kinds of stuff, and you know didn't move, move the dial on the numbers for the for for the government and basically they're going to have a challenge to respond to um to that that issue um the conservatives for example 
barely have any put out any, any policy, but they tapped into that frustration that people have mm -hmm. and that feeling that is like, okay, somebody's listening to me. Because I think what a lot of people are feeling is nobody has been listening to me. All these years, nothing has been done. And so I think the, um, the policies that are going to create a, an immediate impact that people are going to feel would be what would be would resonate the most but well, that's not going to happen you can't you can't too, just right? you that's can't the problem. yes yeah. you can't just you know yeah. from these yeah, are policies well, that will take time i'm a federal and provincial level i agree at the municipal level and i would suggest that's where the challenge has been it's obviously the the ocp should, should have been rehauled 30 years ago and uh, and then as DCs, you, you lower DCs to a certain level that makes the math work and change the OCP to allow as of right zoning for lots of places where we all agree there should be higher you know, density. You that's an interesting and one. And immediately there is thousands I, and thousands and thousands of units going rapidly. And then the problem will be there's not enough people to build it. But the OCP, you can win votes and lose votes. And now you can yeah, win hey, hey. votes See, and lose votes. I don't yes. really care about winning or losing votes. <laughs> yeah. I'm just talking about what's the right but thing to his, do. His question yeah, is, know, how do you, how do, what, what is going to yeah. get you? And th that is always a... The NIMBYs, an, a, and we've had that long conversation yeah. about fortunately, that too. Yeah. Um, fortunately, the NIMBYs is, is growing in our city. Yeah. And, and I think that um, it's, it's becoming a conversation, you know, when certain people go into those development meetings and say, no, I, I don't want this condo. It's, you know, we have enough people. And then they see some of the youth coming in and saying, can I, can you just build me a home that I can afford to live in this, in this neighborhood? And, and that is very powerful. I've been in some of those development meetings and it's and the baby boomers now with their 20 something year old kids. And they're going, Oh, how the hell do I get this guy out of my basement? It's like, Oh yeah, well, maybe you I to, should you, allow that condo to go down the street. Yeah, development in your neighborhood. yeah, exactly. During your time in uh, government, what are you most proud of in terms of tackling the affordable issue? And you, and you already identified that you really had a spectrum of uh, attention on that sector over your, over your uh, tenure there. So what would you be most proud of in terms of successes in that space? Because we kind of, we're fixing right now on all the kind of the, all the head, or the tail uh, headwinds, but uh, where, do you see the, where do you see the winds from? I mean, the partnerships, you know, the, the way you're gonna, especially on the affordable housing, the way that you build affordable housing and some of the most successful projects in the city of Toronto and Dream has had, you know, look at West on Lens. It's a partnership with provincial government, federal government, municipal government, other private sector, nonprofit sec non sector. Uh, it's it's so successful. Talk about, you know, I was actually the city council, the city councillor and the chair of planning and housing announcing it with the minister in 2018. And mm. last year we were last summer we were welcoming residents. So from RFP in 2018 to having it build and welcoming residents in the building, that's a huge success. That's what we need more of. And creating programs like the Open Door that gave no DCs, no property tax on affordable housing uh, to, you know, uh, uh, companies that are willing to uh, include affordable housing in their projects, uh, changing uh, the, the sale of the land to instead of highest and best use to create those kinds of partnerships like we have programs through the CREATE-TO, uh, creating programs for acquisition like the multi-residential acquisition program uh, that this year had $100 million to acquire uh, apartment buildings in the city and, and maintain affordable housing. I think those partnerships um, I, that's what I'm proud of. It's, it's bringing different people, um, because that's the only way that you're going to be able to tackle, uh, the affordable housing issue is when you have cooperation, which is what we need a lot more between governments to get this thing going, which is always a challenge, but. I feel like we should have a summit. <laughs> <laughs> just lock the door. Yeah. Settle it all. Just take, just pick five people <laughs> yeah. from each level of government, <laughs> lock the door and say, no one's coming yeah. out until there's five of you remaining. <laughs> We've had lots of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you I, know what? Me, I know. I, I, I've, it's interesting to see because I've been on this issue for so for so long, and now that it's really popular, it's like every week there's a new report. Oh, every month there's a summit. Can we just get on? <laughs> we put, Can we, put, we just we get on and Michael get Brooks, action? You, give, you put Michael Brooks from Real Pack with the key to that door, and he doesn't unlock the door until they come out with a reasonable solution <laughs> yeah. that he supports. And that would be, and I, I, I use Michael Brooks. I don't, you probably know him from yeah. Real Pack. He acts as the representative for us as the community in, in, to say, okay, they've come up with a good idea. The situation right now, and, and we do have a housing crisis. People like to use this and people don't. Like We have it in, in the social you know, supportive housing and governments need to do major investments and they need to really 
deal with that that part of the spectrum. So, and, and um, we're almost at a time, but we haven't spent a lot of time talking about your current role at Dream. And I think you had said you're, uh, you know, kind of responsible for, you know, government relations, right? And so affordable housing, affordable and you can't really do affordable housing well, exactly. without so working with governments. Maybe as just well. talk about what that means and and what kind of things you're focused on in your current role. Well, um, you know, Dream is you know a, a company that builds communities more than than anything. So we, we want to make sure that we are um, building mixed income communities and affordable housing is a big part of our portfolio. It's part of our, you know, the impact that we want to have and we see it as a good business decision as well. Uh, to have our workers, you know, that work in our offices or, or retail to be able to live close to where they, they are. So it's a smart business decision. And how do we deliver that? Well, we deliver that by partnering, partnering a lot with governments. Um, we develop on government land like it, we did in West on Lands, um, like uh, we, the project that we have at uh, Keyside, where, yes, we've purchased the land, but, you know, there's a lot of deliverables on sustainability. There's a lot of deliverables on a, uh, working with governments to create the affordable housing in there. Um, and, uh, and, and that work uh, goes hand in hand with the municipal, provincial and federal level. So we work, you know, with CMHC on different fronts. Uh, we work with uh, the city, um, not only on their lands and their projects, but um, also you know, proposing policy changes as well that uh, that could benefit not only us, but the industry in general. So um, that's the role is to create great communities, uh, increase the amount of affordable housing, uh, but also work with governments that one thing that really attracted me when I came to Dream is like they love to think outside of the box. They always like to push the envelope. And so when we push the envelope, we push for our projects, but it ends up being uh, you know, something that gets done in the industry. You know, they did it with uh, MLI Select, right, with CMHC. They, they were kind of the pilot project, and, and now it's a huge program that is benefiting uh, lots of people. Our project on Keyside, we are, you know, it, the affordable housing is going to be owned by the city, which is something that they're aiming for. It's working with three orders of government. We are developing. We're, we're, we're going to be the, the first project that is going to put shovels on the ground to have that model being created. And uh, that is really exciting because you're, you're impacting that community. You're impacting your business, but uh, you're, you're creating policy and and advancing, um, you know, the possibility of creating more affordable housing in our city and in our country. Well, the creation of affordable housing almost shows that the system does work to some degree. Obviously, uh, you know, it's not perfect, but yeah, I mean, uh, Dream as a whole is spitting out a lot of affordable units. There's Dream Impact Fund. There's uh, a lot of positive work coming out of your organization. So something to be proud of. We just need to replicate it 30 times. <laughs> yeah, I agree. To even, to even I'm with start, you. To even start <laughs> 30 more key to sides. To start and battling there. the crisis that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you very much for taking your time to join us. Uh, thank you to First National for powering the podcast. And of course, uh, thank you to Informa for hosting us here as part of the video a speaker series and Fuller Landau for sponsoring the podcast. Thanks again, Anna. Appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.